This is the LINK project, Leadership and Community Project. Uh, it was designed and is, is, is implemented by Christchurch people, community people for community folks. And it's, you know, really the vision was for, let's design something for folks that are doing amazing things in the communities, but probably um, are invisible in those communities. And let's make something that actually brings um, those people and the amazing things that they do to the surface. So that's what tonight's about. It's about celebrating the communities that you all come from. Um, Lynx went last year with 40 communities and it's going this year with 45. And there's people from Link 1 and 2 here tonight. But tonight's really about the ones from Link 1 um, sharing some of the things that they've been doing in their communities. And you can see a big diversity of communities. We're talking about places and also communities of interest from all around Greater Christchurch. So uh, what I'm going to do is hand over to Claire Phillips from the council who's Claire's the chair of the governance group or the link steering group and then I think Claire will hand over to Leanne. Thanks Chris. Um, kia ora koutou. Thank you everybody for coming tonight and welcome. As George said, welcome to your place. Um, as the chair of the link steering group, um, I'd like to first and foremost thank Chris Jansen and Chris Minnie, Tim Pitsley, um, Jane and Cohort 1 participants particularly for um, the work they've done in putting together these stories that um, you'll learn a little bit more about tonight. Um, Link is a, it's a unique um, collaboration really, it's a unique one too and it's one founded on a common vision. Um, and is certainly a high proportion of trust and um, it, it required everybody, government departments, local government agencies being all on the same page at the same time and it didn't quite happen like that um, to begin with but it did happen, much the same as community development. So um, on behalf of the steering group I'd like to say a big thank you um, also to Sarah, uh, the Earthquake Recovery Authority, um, who led the initial stages of the development of LINK in partnership with community leaders um, and it got uh, handed over and as you know now the resilient of Sarah is no longer um, around but um, this is a, a legacy of the work that began in the resiliency team. Um, we've got on the steering group the Red Cross, uh, Rata Foundation, Wayne Francis Trust, Waimakarevi District Council, MSD and some community reps. Um, previously Stephen Phillips was a community rep who was the uh, ex-CEO of Age Concern and latterly Steve Jones is on uh, our steering group who's a, um, an alumni of Cohort 1. So thank you Steve for stepping in and providing that community um, um, focus. So um, in addition I'd like to thank the Tyndall Foundation too and other formerly known as the Polytech who have provided a really amazing space for Link to flourish in with your additive workshops and sessions and things like that. So um, it's been, as I said, it's been funded and supported by multiple agencies and all of those agencies have got their own priorities and processes and rules and procedures and um, decision making bodies and things like that. So the uniqueness of getting everybody in the same room, um, believing in the same vision and saying, yeah, well we can um, add a little bit to make up the piece of the jigsaw um, is, a, is a new way of working in Christchurch and one that I hope that we repeat in other, in other ways too. Um, so I don't know about you, but since the earthquakes, um, for me, a sense of continuity is really important in my life. So many things have broken and stopped and changed and started and gone and disappeared and, and been brought back um, again. And, and those parts of life that have defined me as a person and those experiences that have defined me as a person, it's really important for me to go back to those people in those places and it's been more prevalent since the earthquakes, a real sense of needing to re reconnect and rebuild either relationships that, that weren't as strong as they could have been before the earthquake but continuity is so important um, for me and I suppose tonight's a bit about um, continuity for the cohort one participants who have learnt and grown so much I think you know hearing the people's feedback of how much they found the link project really supported them in their work and, and their lives so um, a sense of continuity bringing people back together and keeping that community alive and sharing your experiences with cohort two and everybody else in the room um, and hopefully we can do the same for cohort two and just build a critical mass of, of community um, that, that we keep going long before the link um, program's um, over. So for many of us, the work we decide to do, either paid or voluntary, is a calling and a vocation, it's not a job, and we're fortunate to have a mayor <laughs> that understands that and the power that dwells within communities and the power of the collective. 
So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Leanne and the Christchurch to address us tonight. Welcome, Leanne, and thanks for coming. Ana mana, ana reo, ana ro rangatira ma. Tene te mihi ki a koto i runga i te kopapa o te ra. Tena koto, tena koto, tena ra tato katoa. Can I acknowledge the Link Steering Group from the Council, the Rata Foundation, the Waimakariri District Council, the Wayne Francis Trust, the University of Canterbury, and the Red Cross, along with the Link Program Facilitators Leadership Lab. Can I also acknowledge on everyone's behalf Can Do Catering, who have provided us with refreshments tonight. Can I just say it's a great name. We want to be a Can Do Council, so it's great to have Can Do Catering here. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for being here this evening. Uh, this is an opportunity to both celebrate and showcase the progress made by the Leadership and Communities Link um, project over the past year. For those of you that are new to Link, um, this is an initiative to support and strengthen local leaders and change agents in our communities, and you've already heard about that um, from Chris as he brought everyone together um, this evening. The, the people that we're talking about, the, the change agents, the leaders, the local leaders, these are the people who do the organising, who get things done, and who get people working together. I think if there's one thing that we've learnt from our experience over the last few years, is that collaboration is the key to everything. Working collaboratively across agencies, across bloody silos, am I allowed to use that word? Um, across um, uh, communities, those are the those. That's what's so core critical, and why it's so fundamentally important. The shift that we've had uh, from the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, a government department with its top-down reporting and top and bottom-up reporting to a minister rather than now the jointly appointed Regenerate Christchurch, jointly appointed by the Council and the Crown, with um, Naitahu having nominated one of those directors as well, jointly funded by the Crown and the Council, and with a commitment on both sides to see a transition to local leadership over a five-year period to a council-controlled organisation. Um, my ambition is to see that happen in three years, and I've heard the Minister say that he'd like to achieve that too, and that's something that we can continue to work for. So collaboration, absolutely the key to getting things done. Um, so the, these are the people that I'm talking about, and the people, uh, the people are you. Link identifies local leaders and offers them support, mentoring and opportunities for learning. And that idea of being supported within a supportive network, um, that is core critical. In many respects, that's why I wanted our city to become part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network, because I wanted to be part of a network where we could call upon others um, and look to others' experiences and, and, and offer our own experience um, in order to strengthen um, resilience programs throughout the, throughout the world. Um, last year I was really pleased to meet the first cohort of local leaders who completed the program, and that was at ARA, formerly known as. Um, and uh, I, I think that, um, uh, yeah, it was, um, you'll get a chance really to check in with this group and hear about their legacy projects. And I'm really sorry I can't um, stay for this, but um, I will hear about uh, those reports um, over the next few days um, from Claire and the team. Link is a fantastic program which for me highlights what leadership is all about and that's what I'm going to talk about. I actually went looking for the speech that I gave last year but I couldn't find it so I found another one and repurposed it for tonight. Um, uh, there was a, a politician who once famously said if you've written a good speech you, should, um, you shouldn't um, change your speech, you should change your audience. So um, some, of you, some of you would have heard it if I'd found last year's anyway. So. Um, the address um, that I found had the theme, Building Leadership from a Firm Foundation, and I thought that, actually that was quite a good theme uh, for tonight. I felt a, a sense of irony in that it was shaky ground as opposed to a firm foundation that saw leaders emerge from seemingly nowhere. Only they didn't emerge from nowhere. Not at all. That's just what it looked like. 
They emerged from their communities, which were in fact the firm foundation, and those community leaders became the voice of the people. It was as if the disruption caused by the quakes actually empowered certain people to step up in a way they may not have envisaged themselves um, doing. I don't know whether Sam Johnson ever woke up before the 4th of September and thought that he might be putting together um, a, a, a structure with a group of friends at university um, that would be available to um, respond uh, to a whole range of things and now a whole concept of community service um, uh, just something that possibly he would not have thought of or his, um, his fellow students who, who made that happen. Um, the Canterbury earthquake sequence has taught me new words and some of you will have heard me say this before that I never knew what liquefaction or lateral spread, spread meant before the 4th of September. But um, the earthquake sequence has actually enabled me to understand words I thought I understood well but didn't actually understand at all, and they were community, resilience, and leadership. My staff gave me a necklace, and normally when I'm um, mentioning this, I have my necklace on, and I just completely forgot to put it on this morning. Um, but they, they, um, they have these three words on them, so they have community, resilience, and leadership written on small beads, but there's a large bead in the center of the necklace, and it's got its own message, and it says, the most courageous act is still to think for yourself aloud. And that is a quote from the very well-known philosopher Coco Chanel. <laughs> now, it's a great quote if you think about it. The most courageous act is still to think for yourself aloud. And why I think it's important is that it is about believe, having the belief the strength of their belief to speak out for what you believe in. And often that requires courage. And that's why it's a courageous act to think for yourself out loud. The three smaller beads, as I said, speak to community resilience and leadership. Community is not the co-location of houses. It, that's a suburb. It's the relationship between the people in those houses and their relationship as a group with decision makers that's community. And of course, community is not limited to location or place. It also refers to communities of interest, uh, communities of identity. A community's social capital is not measured by socioeconomic status. It is measured by the strength of those relationships between people in those communities and with decision makers. And that's about the reciprocity in the relationship as well. Resilience is not strength in the face of adversity, that's stoicism, something we Cantabrians have in spades. Resilience isn't just about maintaining critical functions and bouncing back into shape after something occurs. That's the kind of infrastructure um, uh, language. It includes the capacity to recover in the long term better than ever before, and if necessary, with the capacity to adapt to a new environment or new conditions when we cannot possibly predict with any accuracy what we will have to respond to at any time in the future, the effects of climate change, a disaster triggered by a natural event, or a crisis triggered by our own doing, man-made crisis they're called, like that, um, communities need to be prepared to respond themselves. The government cannot be everywhere and cannot do everything. And, you know, I've been saying to people it's time that we stop expecting the government, the council, to do things, it's actually more about how do we as communities engage with the government or with the council and do things for ourselves with their support. And actually I was absolutely delighted that so many of the submissions on the long-term plan actually reframed the um, debate around these very issues with a large number of communities. Um, but it, um, now I guess that if communities have been disempowered to the extent that they are unable to fend for themselves, then recovery will be much slower and much more challenging. 
So the stronger the social capital, the greater the social capital, the more quickly communities will respond and more quickly will communities recover. In that sense, it is the capacity to co-create a new future which actually requires we in decision-making positions to let go of a significant part of our authority. That is something I now recognise as the true hallmark of resilience. And then we come to leadership. Leadership is not a position. It is a characteristic based on certain qualities. Sometimes people are described as leaders, but they don't have these qualities. And sometimes these qualities are evident in people who do not hold leadership positions, but they are true leaders in the real sense of the word. I remember going to a forum where young people were asked to describe leadership, and they gave these words, strong, decisive, committed, authoritative, responsible. Now I guess that any textbook would associate these words with what it takes to be a leader, but this is what is described as the heroic model of leadership, someone who comes in and takes charge. Such leaders can issue orders and they are um, obeyed. I'm not one of those. Um, in the emergency response period following a disaster, I have to say that people often look for this form of leadership because it's incredibly comforting to know that somebody knows what they're doing and that they will take care of things in the immediate um, aftermath of a disaster. Um, but there is another way to define leadership and this definition ties in with my experience once the crisis is over and we begin the process of recovery. And that's very soon after the event. The kind of leader that emerges in this environment is one that is respectful, engaging, empathetic, inclusive and intuitive. Now, I don't know why, but we seem to think of women when we hear those words and yet we don't necessarily think of women when we look for a leader. And I guess the question I've been asking is have we had the image of the heroic leader drummed into us to the extent that we don't actually see these qualities for what they are? These are the qualities that build trust. So even though I've made it sound like it's all about, um, you know, women should be leaders, it's actually people who inspire trust. And trust is one of those can't do without words um, in a post-disaster environment. And actually, if you're building leadership, trust is absolutely at the heart of it all. And I have said on the odd occasion when there's no media presence, that trust has been missing in action in our city for some time. So the distinction between a heroic leader and that true leader is not about taking charge, it's actually about engaging others in a way that enables them to lead in their own right. And we saw that um, in Christchurch time and time again. So going back to my necklace, which I would be clutching at this point if I were wearing it, um, the message I take from my necklace is courageous leadership that speaks the truth and empowers communities to co-create the environment in which they live will build resilience in the true sense of the word. And I think that's an incredibly powerful message to carry with me on a necklace. Um, but it's something that you can carry with you. Understanding that Link offers you the opportunity to come together and network across the city and to strengthen those networks and relationships. It gives you access to the collective strength and knowledge of that network, access to a diversity of knowledge and opinion, access to a diverse range of skills, access to a wider set of connections. And being part of the strong network will help build resilience personally and collectively. But the last thing I want to say is that, um, is to say is, is be courageous. That's that other word that sits in that necklace message. It is an essential part of leadership, and it includes the courage to fail. I remember someone sending me J.K. Rowling's speech on the occasion of Harvard University's 357th commencement, and she talked about failure, not to glamorise the experience of finding herself at the end of a broken marriage as a solo parent, parent with a classics degree and not much else, in fact, she said there was nothing glamorous about her experience of poverty and despair. But she said this, Why do I talk about the benefits of failure? Simply because failure meant a stripping away of the inessential. 
I stopped pretending to myself that I was anything other than what I was and began to direct all my energy into finishing the only work that mattered to me. Had I really succeeded at anything else, I might never have found the determination to succeed in the one arena I believed I truly belonged. I was set free because my greatest fear had already been realised and I was still alive. And I still had a daughter whom I adored and I had an old typewriter and a big idea. And so rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. You might never fail on the scale I did, but some failure in life is inevitable. It is impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you might as well not have lived at all, in which case you fail by default. Failure gave me an inner security that I had, a, I had never attained by passing examinations. Failure taught me things about myself that I could not have learned any other way. I discovered that I had a strong will and more discipline than I had suspected. I also found that I had friends whose value was truly above rubies. The knowledge that you have emerged wiser and stronger from setbacks means you are ever after secure in your ability to survive. You will never truly know yourself or the strength of your relationships until both have been tested by adversity. Such knowledge is a true gift for all that it is painfully won and it has been worth more to me than any qualification I ever earned. I mean, go and watch her deliver this speech. She gives another amazing message about the power of imagination, not for writing um, books, but actually the capacity for empathy. It's a wonderful, wonderful speech. So the, the, the quote really has come to mean a lot to me over the past few years because it really has spoken to me about the experience we've collectively shared in the city. And I guess the knowledge um, that I've gained and others have gained would be the, the gift that J.K. Rowling spoke of. I left my parliamentary role because I felt I was needed here and I never wanted to have to confront the question, the question that goes, what if? What if I hadn't? I didn't ever want to have to ask myself that question. And that's what I hope each one of you takes from this program. Your firm foundation for building leadership may in fact be shaky ground, it may in fact be failure but it will never involve you asking, what if? Because whether you succeed in your endeavour or not, you will have shown that you too understand what truly matters and that you are prepared to stand up and be counted. And that's what leadership is. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ratātou katoa. Thank you very much, Leanne and Claire, that was superb. Um, I was sitting there thinking, I'm so glad we videoed that, because uh, we're about to listen to it again. So um, thank you very much, and um, think for yourself out loud. Love it. So what we're going to do now is have a five minute break and a chance to get some more food. Leanne can slip out, get some drink, and what we're going to do is come back in five minutes, and four of the link, our folks have um, volunteered to just share for five minutes each about their project, and then after that it'll be mix and mingle around all the posters. Thanks very much. Basically, uh, one of the parts of the LINK project is for the folks who are um, leaders in their communities to um, think about the stuff they've already been doing with their colleagues and develop that a bit further. And so um, the LINK one group that were last year um, did heaps and heaps of work on that and obviously those things are ongoing this year. And so a um, a couple of months ago we decided to try and curate those ideas into something that was more visible. And that's the posters you see tonight. Um, so what we're going to do first is ask four of the um, communities just to come and share for five minutes. And I'm going to be really strict on the time because it would be easy to speak for half an hour. But just a five minute little insight, maybe a story, just a little bit about your community. And if you look on the posters or you've seen them already, key success factors and key learnings. Those are the things we are asked people to talk about. So the first one is Daisy. Come on up, Daisy. And Daisy's from many communities. <laughs> so 
So Daisy, I was just saying, as you're clapping, Daisy's um, hard to describe which community she's part of. There's about seven. Um, and I we could say uh, Pacific Performing Arts, we could, could say Secondary Education, we could say Rugby League, etc, uh, etc. Et but I'm not too sure which one she's speaking about tonight. Thank you. I was speaking on um, performing arts tonight. Let's go to the and love the inga name as a uma se o fat vow fat vow lava fat salo fat to le sunga ya um lienda zio fat pele malu or link facilitators malu a feel in a fiafi talofa 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 lava. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, especially to our link facilitators. It really was a game changer for me, and I'm just really um, honoured just to be able to be on the, here tonight to share briefly about Brave, a Daisy Poetry Promenade, which was a project that Link um, sowed a seed into. The Brave Poetry Promenade took place at Aranui High School in the Music Block. If you haven't been here, the Music Block is this massive building and it has a school hall in there, a theatre, two massive classrooms, a recording studio. Um, and it, so we did the poetry promenade in here and we had two MCs that directed the audience through all of these seven spaces. Um, and without talking you through how it went, but within these spaces there were arts performances such as original poetry. Our youngest performer from the community was seven years old. Um, we had poets from Kashmir High School, the current Christchurch Youth Poetry Slam champion, Shira Peace. We had a double bassist playing a Samoan hymn, gospel singers accompanied by a grand pianist. Uh, we had a tatau video. Uh, tatau is a Samoan traditional tattooing. And so we had the models on here, we had a professional photo shoot, and while that was happening, we had another videographer come and interview them and then put all of that data into a nine minute video. So everything was quite strictly timed so that the audience could move like clockwork throughout all these different spaces. We had a live listening party with the, um, the Judah band. We had DJ Infrared, who if you don't know, now you know, he is Christchurch's premier DJ. Um, has represented New Zealand on an international stage and he got to s try something new which hasn't been done in New Zealand which was him spinning his own original tracks with a live band in the recording studio and so the audience were able to, to watch and experience that. And it finished with um, the audience moving into the theatre and we had a live si'i alofa, which is a gift exchange. So only chiefs speak in this, and it's a language that's dense in metaphors um, derived from nature. And it's kind of like if Chris Mene's family, someone's getting married, uh, <laughs> um, and they're like our extended family, looks at his daughter, um, I'd be coming in. Um, our family would come in um, and we'd bring gifts, we'd bring fine mats and thousands of dollars and there'd be this exchange that happens where we give that gift and then the chief on Chris Manny's side gives that gift back and then we give some of it back but it's the oratory and it's so amazing to watch and we wanted to showcase that for the community. And then we finished in true Samoan fashion with Samoan food um, at the end. The success factor, one of the most poignant moments for me was all of these models that are in that, we've got people from all walks of life. We've had a CEO there, one of the ladies is a dean at Shirley Boys High School. We've got tertiary students. And after that photo shoot, we were kind of sitting there and there was this silence. And I couldn't put a word on it, but afterwards we kind of just could only describe that energy as being proud of being Samoan and proud of being Cantabrian. The key learnings, Oh, just another success factor. Because of this innovative performance, we've got the big conversation, which is Creative NZ's major conference happening here next month in Christchurch. And they have asked us to present because they're like, what's this thing about community and how can you involve, it's so different, it's so new, can you come and share your learnings on that? I thought that was pretty cool. The key learnings, language is a great locator. And when I thought about if I was to hashtag the 51 collaborators that were part of this project into the five main keywords that they spoke about. It was youth, ainga, which is Samoan for family or, commu or community, proud, identity, and Christchurch. Art stimulates the senses. It awakens us to beauty. It fills us with awe. It connects us to others and inspires us to be better human beings. The Brave Poetry Promenade reminded us of who we are 
where we come from. Not all of us were Pacifica, we were multi-generational and multicultural as well. Brave taught us that community is so much more than belonging to something. It's about building, collaborating, and co-creating something together that makes belonging matter. I'd like to finish with a story from a community member, and rather than telling you, I thought I'd invite her to tell it herself, our youngest poet that performed, Hadassah Timo. I am a Dene Samoa, knitted with seapple, dotted with ink, tap, 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 so let up a back. I am to low and fafatai so for you my me I to see I might all of me I law. Mmm, delicious. Because respect is our currency and food is our love language. I'm supper soy, I'm taro, swimming in the ocean with coconut cream. I'm hibiscus, I am turtle, I'm Nafano, someone under Prince S. My hands weave stories with mysteries and histories. My hands can change the world. I am a Dene Samoa. I am swagged so by the amazing grace. I am busy and to love by the poetry. I am a Dene Samoa. <laughs> Wow, Hadissa, thank you so much. And Daisy, that was amazing. Whew. Daisy's actually um, quit her job at the end of last year and she's studying full-time in the MBA at uni, which is absolutely amazing. She's just uh, continued to jump up and up and up. So, well done, thank you. Second community group, uh, can I invite Cherie Haimana and Steve Jones up here, please? So um, Sheree is uh, from the Rickerton um, neighbourhood support groups, uh, etc. And Steve is uh, from the police. <laughs> G'day, um, yes, I'm Steve Jones. I'm sergeant of the Rickerton neighbourhood policing team. Um, and I'm here tonight to get the privilege of introducing what we're here for, which is the Rickerton West, or the Rickerton um, Welcome Packs that were introduced into the community through the um, LINK project and the funding that we got through that. Um, so Cherie's here with me. As you've heard, she's from the Neighbourhood Support. She's actually part of the community. Um, we've also got Sam here with us, who I collared at about 12.30 today and says, hey, come along. Um, take the time to have a chat to Sam when we're down by the post today. She's got some amazing stories that fit in with what we're talking about here. Um, <coughs> Also just want to mention um, Carol Renoff from Oak Development, she's been a real integral part of this project and also Housing New Zealand, it's a, been a very multi-agency, multi-group and people in the community project so um, it's really important for that. Um, Rigan Neighbourhood Policing Team started in 2012 and it was about getting into the community, getting into the community and um, building positive relationships and working with the people in the community to actually change um, the crime problems in that community. Um, it, it's, it's been quite successful and I've learned a few lessons over the last four years. It's been quite a journey for me. Um, probably the main thing I learned is that the people in the community are actually the ones that are best placed to identify the problems in the community and to actually solve those problems. And the role of police and other agencies is actually just to be there and actually support that community ownership and, and give them the help that they need to do that. Um, the other thing that I have learned is that there is one word that will solve all the problems in this community. Hello. It is as simple as that. Getting people to actually know each other in the community and build positive relationships and feel part of that community is very transformational. It, it, it changes people's lives, it changes the whole community and from that we actually end up with crime reduction and a safer community. 
And so I guess really the, the Welcome Pack project really rolled out of both of those things, that it was really important to welcome new people into that community. We had a whole range of new housing New Zealand complexes coming into that area and amongst a discussion amongst the community, so not pleased, but just amongst the whole community groups that we work with was that we really want to welcome these people into the community and make them feel part of it. And um, so through that, the, the Welcome Pack project came up. And I'm going to let Sheree talk a bit about how we went about it and okay. what we did. So we decided that it would be a really good idea that uh, we went along and we met these new families that have come into our community. So we decided to hold a pancake breakfast barbecue <laughs> at 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, <laughs> the response was amazing. Um, we were welcomed with open arms. They were embraced us. They were uh, the residents were just and the families were just so happy um, that we connected with them uh, personally just by being there, welcoming them into the community. So um, through that we were able to obtain new members to attend our neighbourhood support group meetings and ideas and initiatives were also brought forward by the uh, new families that have come into our community. So we're very grateful uh, and we're thankful for the funders for providing the opportunity for us to engage and have community uh, togetherness with new res residents who have come into our community. So we're very grateful um, and we thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Sheree and Steve. Um, it just rem I remembered as they were speaking, they actually have made a video about the um, community there. It's on the Link Project website. Um, really, really worth having a look at. It's filmed in a, in a garden. Um, Steve sort of pokes his head out from behind the cabbages at the beginning of the movie. Um, Daisy's also made a bit of a movie about um, Brave, which is also on the Link Project site. Uh, third group, I'd love to invite um, Jane Harrison and Leslie Fulton up from South Brighton. There they are. Just put that down. Everyone hear me? Okay, um, so I was part of the Link One cohort obviously last year and had an amazing opportunity to actually be invited and to receive a donation for our community to set up a brand new community group in South Brighton while I was doing the Link program. Um, and we'd had a lot of focus obviously in that part of Christchurch on um, the aftermath of the earthquakes and really felt that it was time that people were starting to pop their heads back up, that a lot of those issues were starting to be resolved and it was time to really focus on the community and the wealth and the richness within our community and I'm not talking about dollars, I'm talking about the people that are there and what they can offer and that that's a way of really supporting and growing the community rather than focusing on what was missing or absent because we'd had a lot of that for a lot of years. And by being part of the LINK program I was able to think really deeply about those things, like the LINK to people here by about now I guess you start to realise that this is a pretty deep process. Um, and on a personal level and you're doing a, a level of reflection that maybe you weren't quite expecting to do. So yeah, we did a lot of that and um, part of the generous donation was that we were able to employ someone for a few hours a week to um, support to Waka Araha. Um, I'm really lucky enough to get Leslie who is a star and spent many hours talking through all those <laughs> those deep issues. And really what we thought was our community needs to have a space. So we see ourselves as we hold a space in the community where all the great stuff in there can come out and can, can grow and develop from, from that space. And so we pretty much don't have many rules or we don't have a committee, we don't have a lot of organisational structure. We invite and engage our community and when there's energy and people want to do stuff, we open the space. Lizzie does all sorts of amazing administrative things to get it all out there and get lots of people involved. And um, it's worked really, really well. So a year later we're now at the point where we um, are looking at creating a permanent home for our group but also for local business, local school, a lot of other local groups, performance venue, um, a whole um, facility because there's no space in South Brighton to do that. Um, but we've created the space of all of this energy. So it's a really, really exciting thing that we're part of, but it's all about these little things that you do that just invite and celebrate your community. So our project, the Learning Exchange, which is what we got the match funding for, was one of those little things that we just started small and has created all sorts of wonderful opportunities. I'll just get Leslie to tell you a bit about that. I put this up. Or I'll duck down. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trouble. 
So, um, as Jane said, one, can you hear me? Yeah. One of the main things we've been doing, well, not one of the one of the spin-off things we've been doing, is the learning exchange, which has come through most of our other activities. So we talk to the local community, we find out what their interests are, and generally there's somebody who's quite keen on sharing their knowledge, and so we create an event where they come along um, free of charge. Um, for we don't pay them and we don't charge anybody, we just provide the space for them to come and learn from each other. And it's been incredibly successful. Um, we we ran oh, eight sessions last year, we've run two, four, we're about up to number six this year. And um, it's just gathering momentum all the time. And the amazing thing is some of those sessions, there's not very many people, we had one session where there was one person showed up, and it was a session on social media, learning computing and social media for older people. But these two people, the teacher and the student, are now really good friends. And they've grown a friendship, they live just along the road from each other, and they meet up for coffee, and now they're involved in the project that Jane and I are also involved in, the new space. Um, so it can have huge effects on people. P this lady was new to the area, didn't know very many people. Last night we had one for acupressure and a lady came along who had not left her house since the, in the evenings since the earthquakes. She was on a benefit and she had no money and to come along somewhere that was local and free, she had a great time. So I, th I think we'll never be getting rid of her. <laughs> so yeah, so it's been really successful and as Jay said, the only thing that we that's stopping us keeping it going further is lack of space. So yeah, it's been awesome. And actually, if people want to know more about learning exchanges, there's lots of ways of doing them. And I actually, the very first day at Link, heard Belinda, Mez from Hurunui, do you want to wave your arm around? <laughs> Say the words learning exchange, and I mean, I'm going to talk to that lady. Um, very experienced in running it, um, so please talk to Belinda as well. And then there's Anne and Margaret from Littleton floating around who had you had your year of learning last year. Some of the kinds of things. So, yep, there's a few of us that are um, quite passionate about this. Thank you, guys. Excellent. <coughs> Excuse me, the last... Um, project to talk about from here is um, Caroline, I'm going to invite you up, and this one um, also is very, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sounding emotional but not really, uh, very close to my heart um, because um, one of my daughters who's here tonight plays in a competition like this and it's um, the, the community of sport. So, Caroline. And it's a lot easier to do it that way, she says. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you for having me here. Obviously I was one of the first cohort as well, so I'd really like to show my appreciation to both Chris's and Tim and all of the team because it was revolutionary, I think. Even when you have a look at what they're doing overseas, internationally, I think this is quite unique to us and if we hadn't had the earthquakes, maybe it's a good thing that's come out of it. But I have a look at the posters that are around and then you see the common words like community, collaboration, uh, all of those sorts of things and it's it basically comes through the key success factors in every poster and that certainly was for us and it reminds me of going back to the cohort last year when we had workshops which were a lot of fun we were doing jigsaw puzzles I'm sure you're doing the same on, on the floor and we were spreading out and we were writing keywords around why we were doing this what drives us as leaders in the community and certainly those words were paramount we certainly didn't see ourselves above anybody else as you probably don't either but it's being an, an enabling and engaging groups so you can achieve what you want to and have that outcome. So that's what was really special to us. And look, we all do sporting and community and all these different things, but I think we just use the vehicles that we're passionate about in order to achieve the same things. So I'd like to thank you very much for that. In terms of um, what our project was funded for, we have a Friday night basketball competition and it has been going for a long time, about 30 years, and it's steadily grown from about 12 teams to 107 teams. And this is just on a Friday night, so it's a logistics nightmare in North Canterbury. Um, we have 10 venues and 12 courts all spread out in North Canterbury, so 26 primary schools compete and they have been really supportive of us. So we thought to ourselves, how do we give back to that community? Because each team is a school team, it's a primary school team, and people come from Harden, Hurunui, um, Waikari, Oxford, 
Kaipoi, um, all of those different things to play. Uh, so it's much, much more than just a basketball game. It's almost like a vehicle, as, as I said before, just to um, have community collaboration. So we have this Friday night basketball program going 10 weeks from September to December and of course it's highlighted in semi-finals and finals but we thought what can we do that's different, what can we do to blend the teams because they come for their game and then they go home and we thought um, but we talked to these young guys who have been involved in the organisation for a long time, they've been playing since they were kids and now they're coaches and they are so passionate about it and it's about engaging those who are passionate about the causes and they came to us and said why don't we do the NBA? Why don't we get the 10 best players from North and the 10 best players from South, mix them up, girls and boys, give them their own um, playing strips with their names on the back. So basically they feel like an NBA player. So we thought, great idea, why don't we do that? So nothing, they don't have to pay for this, it's an, it's an added event that's part of the whole 10 weeks and um, we basically go around sourcing the players and we choose the 10, we get two invitational coaches as well for each team and they get their own coaches shirts and we get a DJ and we invite the whole community to it and as you can see we get everybody, we get people with face painting on, we get balloons, we get everything. So it's not just a sporting event, it's a community event. And you can see people are not necessarily grouped in schools anymore, they're grouped with friends. They're crossing over with primary schools, they're, they're coming with their families, they're, they're all dressed up. And it's just a, a great event. So you can see that one's blue and one's red in terms of the details of that. But we've got a big shield, so it's a real north and south war at the end of the day, um, but it's all in the name of fun and we're really enjoying it. So one logistical thing um, we thought of in the first year, because we've only had it two years now, is we didn't have it on its own night because everyone's going around, parents are trying to deliver kids every now and to all of these venues and we thought we're going to have to have it on a night that they're already coming out, otherwise people won't know what it's about, they won't come out specifically for it. So we trialled it in the middle of people having their games, but we spread it out so they could at least see a part of, their game, a part of the game. And um, it was really good. Now I think that we're going to be able to have it on its own night, so which is great. So we're building it into the program so people can come and support their friends as part of it. So in terms of um, supporters, we've got sponsors on board now because we've got thousands of kids playing. So we have a very positive message. Um, for spectators as well, in terms of how they encourage their children. <laughs> I'm not looking at you, Chris. <laughs> um, because they can get very enthusiastic on the side, so it's all about um, positive, uh, positive messages in terms of these kids, because they're only primary kids at the end of the day. Um, so we have big posters that are out the front that are saying, um, the coaches are volunteers, uh, referees, uh, not paid for this, all that sort of thing. So it's really positive messaging that's coming through it as well. But in terms of our supporters, we've got Subway on board. And Subway have come to the party by giving away um, gifts to all of the community. So they give cookies and things like that. Um, and we've got, a, as I said, a big shield for the players. So basically over the night, I'll be really quick, over the night, um, the players are introduced in darkness with big music pumping. So each player is introduced um, in their own name. Yep, smoke. <laughs> no, not necessarily smoke. Um, but they're introduced in their own name, so everybody applauds them. They come running out with a spotlight, and they just feel like a million dollars, you know. And another thing that we didn't realise was a really good success factor coming out of it is that we have a five and six grade and a seven and eight grade, and the five and six grade now say, I aspire to be in that team. Uh, that's my goal. I want to be in the All-Stars team. So it's not an elitist thing. It's more of a case of trying to give those kids a pathway. Um, and, and kids continue, Kids still wear their shirts after they've had the games, so they're really proud of themselves in terms of that. Um, another thing was the two young gentlemen that had created the whole idea, because it wasn't our idea, it was we only leveraged what came through our community. And he's now employed by the club. And he's got all of these ideas he wants to do. <laughs> and we have to say, whoa, okay, <laughs> one at a time. Um, but this has been a really good um, exercise for us and it's just brought the community together and people talk about it all the time. So thank you for supporting it. Okay, I have to put it down. <laughs>
thanks, Caroline. Thanks to all of you. Fafatai Lava, Lausasunga, Daisy, and daughter. Uh, that was a fabulous start. Um, great to reconnect with the stories that you have lived, um, all of you who presented. Um, we've got at least 16 other stories which are on the, the boards, which are freestanding. Uh, and I'd like to invite you to take the next half an hour um, to get up, have a look at these stories and to meet the people who um, have made these, these community stories happen. Uh, and I think we've got most of, of those people here tonight. Uh, so half an hour, we've still got drinks and nibbles. Nibbles are over on the table. Um, and while uh, you are travelling around um, negotiating these stories, we're going to play a couple of video vignettes um, about the link. Uh, and then once those videos are finished, Neil and Ella are going to be our musicians um, up until about 10 to 8 when we'll conclude the evening. So with signalling that, at 10 to 8, I'm going to randomly ask two or three people who are still here at 10 to 8 <laughs> to come up and share a reflection about the story or a story that really stood out for them and why. Forewarned? Enjoy the next half an hour. We'll see you soon. Yeah, exactly.